Welcome to our presentation, HIV, Fact versus Fiction. Hi, I'm Peter Crackle. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of pharmacology in the Department of Physician Assistant Sciences at St. Francis University. There I teach pharmacology to the physician assistant program. Let's talk about our goals and objectives for our lecture. We're going to describe common misconceptions about HIV and AIDS, including populations, modes of transmission, treatment, and the vaccine availability. We're going to state the current Florida law on AIDS, its impact on testing, confidentiality of those test results, and the treatment as described in Florida statutes. We're also going to provide an update on antiretroviral therapy for HIV to include the six categories of HIV medications where we'll discuss their mechanisms of action, efficacy, dosing, safety, tolerability profiles, and those first-line combination therapies. We'll also provide updates pertaining to pre-exposure prophylaxis as well as post-exposure prophylaxis. The title of our presentation is Fact versus Fiction, so what are we going to call fiction? I have 56 students in my class at St. Francis University. All of them are in their fourth year of college. We have not yet discussed the topic of HIV and AIDS, so they haven't had any formal HIV training in their other classes. They might have picked up some ideas from biology, from watching the news, and from other media sources. They've had some health-related classes, but nothing really formal on the treatment and prevention of HIV. So I decided to have them fill out a survey for those questions and see what educated people know about HIV. Here's what the survey looked like that I developed. The first question was, describe the most common ways HIV is transmitted, male, female, ethnic groups, and sexual orientation, demographics as well as mode of transmission. Uh, describe the drug therapy. How often, how long, and how many drugs? Uh, how often are they given, their potential costs? And I wanted to find out what they thought the durability was of an HIV regimen. Once we put a patient on an HIV regimen, how many years can we expect it to last? Is there an HIV vaccine available? And if not, why not? What is the likelihood of HIV transmission to healthcare professionals? Can it be treated if exposed? Wondering that they're going to be around needles and pulling blood samples, I wondered what their thoughts were as far as healthcare professionals being exposed to HIV. And the final question, number five, if we have an HIV patient that we diagnose at age 35, what's her life expectancy going to be? Well, the survey answers for question number one about transmission were, most students said men having sex with men and African Americans were your most common group. They also included accidental needle sticks and sexual intercourse. Um, most of them said that it was equal distribution between male and female, ethnic groups, and sexual orientation, meaning that everyone is equally at risk for this. And another student said oral sex, vaginal sex, and sharing of needles all common modes of transmission for HIV. Well, let's take a look at what the Center for Disease Control tells us. For the first time in 1996, as we can see on this graph, the number of deaths from adult and adolescent blacks and African Americans exceeded the white population. And since that time, if we notice the number of annual deaths of African Americans with AIDS has continued to be higher than those for all other races or ethnicities. It's shown by that pink line at the top. From 2006 to 2009, the estimated number of people living with HIV increased 8.2% from 1,061,000 to 1,148,000. The number of males living with HIV was more than three times higher than the number of women. Even though my students thought it was equally distributed between male and female, males three times the higher incidence. Among the racial and ethnic groups, our black population had the highest number of persons living with HIV, accounting for about 44% of all persons living with HIV in 2009. And this estimate is followed by the whites, Hispanics, persons of multiple races, Asians, American Indians, 
or Alaskan Natives, and finally other Pacific Islanders. So the African Americans did indeed have the highest number of persons with HIV, again not equally distributed as my students thought. Here's a graph of the ethnicity and sex and the number of people alive with HIV. And we can see the greatest bar, the greatest representation is the African American population, followed then by the whites, followed by the Hispanics, and then uh, the little slices of pie are taken up between multi-race Asians, Alaskan, and Pacific Islanders. When we look over at the smaller donut, we see the male to female ratio, males comprising well over 75% and females about 25%. Many of us, including my students, feel that the injection drug use uh, would be equal to the male to male sexual contact. And this slide just shows that that isn't quite the case. Male to male sexual contact accounts for most of our HIV cases, followed then by the injection drug use and heterosexual contact. And when we look at about 2007, the heterosexual contact bar actually exceeds that of injection drug use. And then we also see the male to male sexual contact and injection drug use combined and then other modes of transmission as well. So now as we come out further and further on this graph, we can see male to male sexual contact still number one then followed by the heterosexual contact, then followed by injection drug use. This next slide shows the percentages based on mode of transmission. Uh, men having sex with men accounts for 61%, heterosexual contact 29% currently, injection drug use at 9%, and then the combination of MSN plus injection drug use currently accounts for 3%. The survey responses for question number two, for drug therapy, how long does a patient need to take it? And how often are these medications given? Well, every student knew that HIV meds need to be taken forever for the life of the patient. Where they seem to have a little confusion, and I got lots to cover when we approached this topic in January, about half of them said once a day and the rest said two to four times a day. So when we cover a little later on in this lecture, we're going to see that medication adherence is greatly improved with once a day dosing. And fortunately, many of the regimens are available now as once a day regimens. We also wanted them to talk about cost. Uh, most students realize that the drug therapy is expensive and the costs range from 3,000 to 20,000 per year one student said they figured about $1,000 per day. Um, how durable is a drug regimen? How many years does it last? Some said that the regimen needs to be changed once a year. Thank heavens that's not true. And others thought for a lifetime. The average student guessed that we can get about three to five years out of a regimen before we have to change it due to the uh, virus mutating. Well, let's talk about the institution of HIV therapy. First, we need to understand this terminology of a CD4 count. Those CD4 cells or T cells are considered to be the generals of the human immune system. They're the ones that signal to the other cells in the body that it's time to get on board and attack. They detect the intruders like viruses or bacteria. Normal CD4 cells for healthy patients are about 500 to 1,000 cells per cubic millimeter. A CD4 count of fewer than 200 is, by definition, a diagnosis of AIDS. A CD4 count can vary from day to day depending on the time of the day that the blood's drawn and whether there's other infections or illnesses present like the flu or STDs. We need to check that CD4 count about every three to six months. The panel recommends highly active antiviral treatment if the CD4 is less than 500, and the panel was 50% for and 50% against instituting HAART therapy if the CD4 is over 500. Right now, the current thinking is start the treatment at 500 cells per millimeter cubed. If it's under 500, you should treat. If it's over 500, the panel currently is divided 50-50. That being said, at the uh, 
AIDS conference in 2012, July 22nd, uh, a Dr. Melanie Thompson spoke and said that she feels that ART therapy should be offered to all adult patients who are HIV positive as soon as possible, regardless of the CD4 count. Dr. Thompson said that it's just a number, and as soon as the diagnosis for HIV is made, that the person should immediately begin treatment with the antiretroviral therapy. The reason for this, she feels, is after 25 years of having drugs available, the drugs are cleaner, the drugs are more effective, and we should start suppressing this virus immediately. Of course, there's a little bit of controversy. Concerns are, do you have to have that patient on board for good medication adherence? Do you want to pay for the medications for an extra probably seven or eight years before they're absolutely necessary? So this should be an interesting discussion between the insurance companies as well as these experts in HIV therapy. One thing we can all agree on is combo therapy is a must, and there are four regimens that are preferred regimens, and this really hasn't changed since October 2011. So the first uh, choice regimen would be two NRTIs plus an NNRTI, which consists of efavirenz, tenofovir, emtricitabine. That's available as a once-a-day pill called a tripla. Also, the two NRTIs plus a protease inhibitor, which consists of ritonavir boosted atazanavir, or reataz, plus tenofovir and emtricitabine. That can be given as norvir, reataz, and truvada. We can also go with two NRTIs and a protease inhibitors, ritonavir boosted darunavir, or presista, with tenofovir emtricitabine, available as a single pill truvada. And finally, the two NRTIs plus an integrase strand inhibitor, raltegravir, combined again with tenofovir and emtricitabine, which would be called Incentris plus Truvada. The way I teach this to my students is with the current recommended preferred regimens, all of them include Truvada, that combination of tenofovir plus emtricitabine, and what varies is the NNRTI, the protease inhibitor, or the integrase strand inhibitor. We need a minimum of three drugs from two different categories. Let's talk about that backbone therapy, or the NRTIs, the nucleoside or nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. How they work is they interfere with that viral RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, and it results in chain termination, which inhibits viral replication. It works on reverse transcriptase is the name of the enzyme that's responsible for that. The advantages of this class of drugs are it's established backbone of combination therapy. Every regimen has to have two of these drugs. We see minimal drug interactions. Most of these are renally eliminated. The doses need adjusted for all except for Bacavir, which is um, alcohol dehydrogenase, and Zeduvidine, which is eliminated by glucuronidation. The disadvantages of these drugs uh, they can cause lactic acidosis, and hepatic steatosis has been reported with them, although it is considered to be rare. Notice that Videx, Dadanacine, and Zaret Stavudine are not included in our discussion, since they're not considered in current therapy as either preferred or even alternate regimen. So I'm not going to burden you with a couple drug names that you'll probably never get to see. But we see we have Emtrevo or Emtricitabine, Viriad or Tenofovir, and most commonly we'll see that dispensed as Truvada, which is that pill from Gilead Laboratories with both of those drugs in it. There's also Epivir, Lamivudine, which is available generically, Ziogen, Abacavir, and Retrovir or Zyduvidine, which is also available generically. The next category of drugs is the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and they're highly selective, non-competitive inhibitors of HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. Their class effects, they all have long half-lives. The half-lives of these drugs are so long that when you decide to stop the regimen for whatever reason, you need to stop the NNRTI first, wait a week, 
and then you stop the NRTIs. So there are very, very long-acting drugs. Uh, there's potential for cross-resistance. Uh, they do see skin rash as a common side effect. There are some cytochrome P450 drug interactions and transmitted resistance to other members of the class can be a problem with these. There are some newer drugs that don't exhibit that cross-resistance. Uh, Indolence and Edirond are the two that um, are kind of resistant to that cross-resistance and the other ones um, are uh, interchangeable as far as that goes. The nivirapine, efavirenz, and alviridine, if you're resistant to one of those drugs, you'll be resistant to all three. The newest drug of this class is Edirond or Rolpivirine. It was released in 2011 as a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It is resistant to that K103 mutation by itself, which again is that mutation that causes that class resistance. Its advantages are it's available once a day. It does have a food requirement. The absorption is uh, depends on low gastric pH. It is co-formulated with tenofovir and emtricitabine as well. Complera is the brand name for that formulation. More virologic failures if the viral load's over 100,000. So if you have a newly diagnosed patient with a viral load of over 100,000 copies per milliliter, you should not start this drug. Efavirenz would be a better choice. We see more failures if you have a high virologic load to start with. We do see fewer rashes with this drug. However, it is contraindicated with proton pump inhibitors. We see fewer lipid side effects. Depression has been reported. It is pregnancy category B, which is a huge plus for this drug because efavirenz or Sustiva is pregnancy category D. We have fewer discontinuations for CNS side effects, and that's why we have to give that Sustiva at bedtime because of those CNS side effects. This seems to cause a whole lot less CNS side effects. Uh, we have to be cautious with this drug, though, for co-administering it with other drugs that can uh, have a torsades risk. So if the other drugs on board have a risk for torsades, we have to be very careful when we start Edirond therapy. Integrase strand inhibitors have been available since about 2008, and these are very nice, clean drugs. Not a lot of drug interactions, not a whole lot of side effects. These have been a real godsend to HIV therapy. And their mechanism of action is that it interferes with the enzyme needed to integrate viral DNA into the host cell DNA. It transports that proviral DNA into the host cell's nucleus, so it blocks integrase, and integrase is kind of what carries in that information into the host nucleus so that the HIV can take over that CD4 cell. Then it's integrated into the target cell's DNA. The beauty of these integrase strand inhibitors are there's no cytochrome P450 drug interactions to speak of. No dosage adjustments are needed. Rather well tolerated, as I said. They can be taken with or without food. It's an option for treatment naive patients, and we also see it used a lot for those people that are intolerant to the protease inhibitors. We'll talk about the protease inhibitors as being the really big guns in HIV therapy, but a lot of people can't tolerate it. One of the problems with the Centris or Raltegravir is that it has to be dosed twice a day. It can be given with or without food, but you do need to give it twice a day. And as we're all so familiar with in this day of medication adherence, twice a day therapy is a lot more difficult for a patient to adhere to than once a day therapy. And the newest HIV drug available is Strybild, which is a combination of l plus Cobixostat. It is given once a day with food. It is only available as a combination. It's not available as monotherapy yet to be given, say, with maybe Comvivir. Let's talk about Stribuild therapy. Very new, very exciting, and it's quad therapy. There's four drugs in this pill that is available from Gilead Labs. It was approved by the FDA on August 27, 2012, and it's a combination of four drugs, Elvitegravir, the integrase strand inhibitor, 
cobixostat, which is the drug that is a booster, and of course our friends tenofovir and tricytabine available as Truvada. But this all comes as one single pill from Gilead Laboratories, and the elvitigravir being the integrase strand inhibitor, and cobixostat is uh, also known as GS9350. HIV researchers love their abbreviations. And that's a booster. It boosts the blood level and the effectiveness of the elvitegravir. By itself, it doesn't have any antiviral activity, but it's used just to simply boost the levels of the integrase strand inhibitor. And therefore, with this drug, we can give it once a day. So we have integrase strand therapy once a day with this drug. What's its efficacy? Very, very efficacious when compared to a tripla where they were measuring suppression to undetectable levels. A tripla had 84% suppressed. Stribild had 88%. The Rayataz ritonavir, the heavy duty protease inhibitor, had 87% undetectable HIV versus 90% for Stribild. So Stribild beat uh, both very, very efficacious efficacious regimens. Let's talk about the big guns of HIV therapy, the protease inhibitors. Their mechanism of action is they're reversible inhibitors of the HIV aspartyl protease. That's that viral enzyme that's responsible for the clipping of viral polyproteins, kind of chops them up and makes them into a package that uh, sends it out of the cell so it becomes infectious. Uh, the advantages of the protease inhibitors is a high genetic barrier to resistance. These guys are very, very durable regimens. The protease inhibitor resistance is rather uncommon, especially if it's boosted uh, with the ritonavir. It also can save those NNRTI options for future use. The disadvantages with protease inhibitors are the metabolic complications. We see a lot of dyslipidemia. We see the fat distribution, formerly known as the Crixaban belly. We see a lot of abdominal adiposity. We see spindly thin legs and spindly thin arms. We also see insulin resistance as well. There's a lot of GI intolerance, a lot of GI upset, diarrhea and gas. And there's a lot of potentials for drug interactions, especially with ritonavir. Uh, ritonavir is considered to be the most potent blocker of cytochrome P453A4. Looking at those drugs, we have Presista, Rayataz, Lexiva, Kaletra, and Norvir. Yes, there are quite a few other ones, and I've avoided those as well, since these drugs that we're talking about that I have mentioned here, these five, are the ones that you're going to see on preferred and alternative regimens or treatment of uh, pediatric or pregnant ladies. We need to avoid omeprazole with any of the atazanavir. That's an important drug interaction worth noting. Atazanavir or reataz needs a lot of acid in the stomach, and we want to avoid any kind of proton pump inhibitors, which would be the equivalent of uh, omeprazole 20 milligrams or greater. Even if you're using the H2 receptor antagonists like the Zantac or Tagamet or Pepsid or Axid, we want to avoid those by at least 12 hours from giving Rayataz or Atazanavir. Fusion and entry inhibitors, we're not seeing these used a whole lot today. The viral, in, viral fusion inhibitor, Fusion or Enfurivatide, blocks the fusion of the HIV virus to the host cell, so it can't latch on to that CD4 cell. Its current use is salvage therapy. It has to be dosed twice a day. They're painful injections. We see a lot of injection site reactions. We see recurrent pneumonia. We see diarrhea, nausea, and fatigue. There's another oral medication that's av available called a CCR5 co-receptor antagonist. It keeps the HIV virus from entering the cell. Its mechanism of action is it binds to the receptor called the CCR5 on a CD4 cell. They did a study called the MERIT study, and the MERIT study got FDA approval for this drug for treatment naive patients. It is considered, however, to be an alternative regimen. Cells Entry is the brand name of the drug. Marivarock is its generic name. It's made by Pfizer Labs. But before you can institute therapy with this, you have to do a trophile 
assay, and a tropile assay is simply a, a blood test to make sure that the HIV therapy will respond. If the HIV virus is resistant to this and doesn't even have those CCR5 receptors, this drug won't work. So you need to do a tropile assay before you even institute therapy. It's close to $2,000 for one of those blood tests. Let's take a look at the timeline of a typical course of HIV infection. When we see the red triangles, what that is referring to is the viral load or the virus count. And we can see at week uh, zero to three, we have virtually no virus in the system. And after infection occurs, at about week nine, we see a very high level of virus. The body is able to overtake the virus and suppress it uh, down to 300 and uh, keep it suppressed. Out to about eight years is when we see the constitutional symptoms. At about year 10, we'll see those opportunistic diseases. And at about year 11 or 12, untreated, we'll see death. When we look at the blue boxes, they're the CD4 lymphocytes. They're the generals that are fighting the infection. And in most patients, we have that level of about 1,000. Notice right after infection, that level drops a good bit down to about 500. It recovers nicely. And then during that clinical latency period, the CD4 count is driven down. Notice that once it's driven down below about 200, we start seeing those opportunistic diseases. And then as the CD4 count drops below 50, and then eventually down to zero, we'll see death. This is all untreated. So just by using the averages, the average age for diagnosis is around 40 to 44 years of age. The average regimen we can expect to last about eight years, and that's good medication adherence. We should be able to get eight years. The current regimens that we have approved are the Sustiva and Truvada, the NNRTI plus the two NRTIs, the Integrase Strand Regimen, which is Incentris plus Truvada, the protease-based Rayataz and Truvada, and the other protease-based regimen of Presista and Truvada. With these four regimens, we could expect our patient with good adherence to get about 32 years, which is pretty close to the life expectancy of a male in the United States. As far as the cost of therapy goes, I have some current prices here. Truvada is retailing for around $1,400 a month. And then I have the other drugs available, the Incentris, Sestiva, Rayataz Boosted, and Presista Boosted, and then combined, also showing Complera and Atripla. And when we look at the Incentris, the Integrase Strand Inhibitor plus Truvada, that's costing about $2,621 per month, which is $31,000 a year, all the way down to the lowest price regimen of uh, the Sestiva and Truvada or the Atripla being close to $25,000 a year. So it is a very expensive disease indeed. When I ask about the availability of an HIV vaccine, if there is one, and if not, why not, most of the students were aware that there is not a vaccine available for HIV. They realized because of the fast mutations, it is, is not feasible to come up with an effective vaccine. So they must have had some virology in their healthcare background. Two of the students asked, however, there isn't a vaccine. They assumed that there was. One student says there was a vaccine, but it was too expensive. Two students said that an HIV is a virus and not a bacteria, a vaccine can't be made. They were, their thinking was only vaccines can be made for bacteria, which certainly isn't true, otherwise we wouldn't have a flu vaccine. And one student said, it's pretty available in the United States. So I had a little over 10% of my students either thought there was an HIV vaccine or that it was too expensive to be used. Well, there are certainly challenges with finding an HIV vaccine. In April of 1984, the U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary, Margaret Heckler, made a hopeful statement about an HIV vaccine based on a conversation that she had with the guy who discovered the virus, Robert Gallo. 
He was one of the co-discoverers of the HIV virus back in 1984, and Gallo said that because he found the virus, he would have a vaccine in a couple years. He said, indeed, that we hope to have a vaccine ready for testing in about two years. Well, obviously, uh, 20 years later, we still are nowhere near having an HIV vaccine that is effective. There are some reasons being offered. The first reason is to date, no one has ever naturally recovered from an HIV infection. And when we think of polio, people used to recover from polio. They might have had some long-term manifestations of the disease, but they recovered from the viral attack. That has not yet happened in HIV infection. A second challenge in developing a vaccine is that the HIV does mutate very frequently. And finally, HIV vaccine tests in animals have not yet yielded accurate predictions of how the vaccines will work in humans. There's just no good animal models for HIV transmission. Because of those three reasons that we have not developed an HIV vaccine, a lot of focus has been on prevention of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. The FDA approved the first drug for reducing the risk of sexually acquired HIV infection. They did that July 16th of 2012. They approved Truvada, the first drug to reduce the HIV infection in uninfected individuals who are at high risk for HIV infection. They may engage in sexual activity with HIV infected partners. Truvada, when taken once a day, is used for pre-exposure prophylaxis, hence PREP, in combination with safer sex practices to reduce the risk of sexually acquired HIV infection in adults at a high risk. The partners in the PREP trial uh, consisted of almost 4,800 heterosexual couples where one person was HIV infected and the other was not. The trial evaluated the efficacy and safety of Truvada versus placebo and it prevented HIV infection, drove it down by about 75 percent compared to placebo. So this would result, as far as real numbers go, results in preventing one case of HIV for every 44 men having sex with men for 21 years. So it is rather effective. Well, we have some issues with this pre-exposure prophylaxis. Studies from 2010 showed that Truvada reduced the risk of HIV in healthy gay men and among HIV negative heterosexual partners by between 44 and 73 percent depending on what study you read. We need to be concerned about resistance though if they're not adherent. One of the biggest problems with resistance in HIV comes from patients not taking their medications. The cost is around $14,000 per year. We need to watch for kidney and liver toxicity. These drugs all do have side effects as we know. One of the things we have to enforce to patients that do opt for pre-exposure prophylaxis is they have to take this pill every day. It's not like it's the morning before or the morning after pill. They need to take it every day. They need to have their HIV status checked every six months and they still have to practice safer sex, which translates into using condoms with each encounter. When I ask the students what is the likelihood of HIV transmission to healthcare professionals as they are, and can it be treated, many of the students said it's highly unlikely given the precautions if they're followed correctly. Some other interesting answers that I got, it is likely when exposed to bodily fluids, which is frequent not likely if proper prevention is used, likely if stuck with a needle, high risk but you can take drug therapy, and the other student said pretty good with needle sticks with infected blood. So let's take a look at post exposure prophylaxis. If you experience a needle stick or a sharps injury or were exposed to the blood or other bodily fluid of a patient, during your course of work, immediately follow these steps. We want to wash all needle sticks and cuts with soap and water. We need to flush splashes to the nose, to the mouth, or the skin with water. Irrigate the eyes with clean water, saline, or sterile irrigants. 
we need to report the incident immediately to your supervisor and immediately seek medical treatment. It is a good idea to have that baseline test done. That way you could show that you were HIV negative at the time of the exposure. So it's real important, especially for workman's compensation, that you be tested immediately upon exposure. Always have the PEP line number posted in your pharmacy, in your IV rooms, anywhere where there are sharps containers. And that PEP line number is a toll-free number, 1-888-448-4911. Make sure you cut and paste that and put it around all of those sharps containers or anywhere where there's a potential for a needle stick. Let's talk about the numbers with post-exposure prophylaxis. The average risk for HIV transmission after a percutaneous exposure of HIV-infected blood is about 0.3%. It is a risk, but it's certainly not as common as my students thought it was. So it's 0.3%. The average after a mucous membrane exposure is even less at 0.09%. The CDC recommends prophylaxis if the source is HIV positive. We have less severe examples like a solid needle and superficial injury. The source has a low viral load or the HIV status is unknown like a Sharps container. The two drug combination therapy can be used which is Combivir. It's a combination of two drugs, both of them being NRTIs, Zyduvidine and Lamivudine. The other drug is, again, our friend Truvada, tenofovir plus emtricitabine. If we have a severe exposure and we need post-exposure prophylaxis, which would consist of a deep puncture or if the source has a high viral load, a symptomatic HIV infection, or acute seroconversion, we're going to want to add a drug Calitro, which is lopinavir, boosted with ritonavir. So that combination is available as a single tablet combined again with Truveda or Combivir. Follow-up testing at six weeks, 12 weeks, and six months again. But make sure you get that baseline test as well. And again, the PEP line number 1-888-448-4911. There's been a lot of excitement about HIV testing done at home. Or a quick advance rapid HIV 1 slash 2, that's HIV 1 or HIV 2 antibody test, detects antibodies to both the HIV 1 virus and the HIV virus in about 20 minutes. It's rapid, it provides those results in 20 minutes and enables patients to learn of their status in a single visit and allows the HIV positive patients to be connected to care immediately. You don't need to have that patient uh, waiting uh, days for the results. It's flexible. It's approved for oral fluid, plasma, finger sticks, venipuncture, whole blood specimens. So it's ideal for both clinical and non-clinical settings. It can be done in a doctor's office or anywhere else where you would want to have a potential scanning area. It's very, very accurate. It's 99% uh, agreement with the Western blot test. The source for this information is www.orassure.com. But how accurate is a home HIV test? Well, correctly detected HIV in those carrying the virus 92% of the time. That means it could miss one person out of every 12 infected that would use the kit. It's extremely accurate at ruling out HIV infection. This test was accurate 99% of the time in ruling out HIV in patients who were not carrying the virus. So that means if it says no, it's no. That would mean that the test would incorrectly identify one patient as having HIV for every 5,000 HIV negative people tested. Should be available online and in stores. Question number five to my students, so what would the life expectancy of an HIV patient be if diagnosed at age 35? Well, four of the students said they would live about 10 more years. Seven of the students said 50. Another seven said 55. 
and as we can see it was pretty evenly distributed uh, a couple of them even said up to age 80 and 11 of them just said living a long time so we can see that it's pretty well spread across the numbers as far as how long a patient would live if they were diagnosed at age 35 well, let's take a look at some numbers the average age of diagnosis is around age 35 to 40 assuming that the regimen changes every eight years based on what we have today which would be an NNRTI, an integrase strand, and two protease based regimens, we could easily add about 32 years to someone's life. And that's not mentioning the newer drugs such as Eteront, which we know is already resistant to that 103 mutation, as well as Stribild, the new integrase strand inhibitor that was just recently approved as well. So we have a lot more drugs that are going to be coming available. So we might even see a lot more years added to 32 but just using the regimens that are currently approved as first-line treatment we could add 32 years most HIV patients should live their life expectancy if they're adherent to their prescribed medications and that's where we as pharmacists and pharmacy technicians can make such a huge impact on this disease we're not going to be doing those virologic studies and those resistance studies and those assays our goal and our job in this whole disease state management is to make sure those patients are taking those prescribed meds on time and the way they are to be taken. Let's take a look at the adherence rates and their effect on viral loads. If we have a level of adherence over 95%, 81% of our patients will have a viral load of under 400 and by agreement with all of the assay companies anything under 400 is considered to be undetectable so anything less than 400 we could consider to be undetectable we can have 81 percent of our patients will have that low of a viral load if they take their medication at a level of adherence of 95 percent if their level of adherence is 90 to 95 percent then that percentage would be about 64 percent would have an undetectable viral load 80 to 90 percent would have a 50 percent undetectable viral load 70 to 80 percent would have one in four would have an undetectable viral load and 70 percent would have would translate to six percent having an undetectable viral load so we can see the importance of taking your medication on time 95% adherence is missing one dose a month. 80% would be missing six doses per month. So it's very important with our HIV patients, especially with this single once a day therapy that they take their medication every single day. And we as pharmacists and technicians working with them to make sure that they do get their medications. Let's talk about pregnancy and HIV. Expert consultation is mandatory. You need to have a very seasoned infectious disease specialist handle this condition. An HIV infected pregnant woman can transmit the virus to her infant a number of ways during pregnancy, at labor, at delivery, or even through breastfeeding. The risk of infection is about 30% if untreated. The risk will drop between 0.7% and 2% if we aggressively manage this disease with medications. Treatment options for a pregnant lady and a newborn baby include Zyduvidine plus Lamivudine, our preferred, which is Combivir, usually taken twice a day. Also add Viramune twice a day or a potent protease inhibitor like Lopinavir, Ritonavir, available as Kaletra. Notice that we want to avoid efavirenz or Sustiva because it's pregnancy category D. For a newborn of an untreated mother, offer Zyduvidine or Retrovir as soon as possible and continue it for six weeks to prevent baby from getting the HIV infection. Pregnant patients, according to the Florida law, the Florida law requires health care providers who takes care of pregnant women for conditions related to her pregnancy that they must offer HIV testing and counsel her on the availability of treatment if she indeed tests positive. 
We also need in Florida to document in writing if the pregnant woman objects to HIV testing and keep that in her chart. And even though she has refused the first time and you've documented it, make sure we encourage testing throughout the pregnancy. If a pregnant woman tests HIV negative, offer follow-up testing six months later. Again, that graph that we looked at with the square blue boxes and the red triangles, we saw that there is a latency to the viral load going up after exposure. So it is important that we test six months later, even if we have an HIV negative test. The exposure window is six months from the time of infection until detectable antibody levels. If HIV positive, the support system is available through the Healthy Start Care Coordination System, and that number in Florida is at 1-800-451-BABY is the way that you're going to contact the family, the family health line. Other Florida statutes for consideration, uh, no person in the state of Florida shall order a test designed to identify the human immunodeficiency virus or its antigen or antibody without obtaining informed consent from the patient. So before we even test in Florida, we must make sure we have informed consent. We also have to explain the right of confidential results to those patients. The information has to be followed up and given to that patient once the results are available. Each county health department shall maintain a list of the sites at which anonymous testing is performed including the locations and the phone numbers and the hours of operations. Consent need not be in writing provided there is documentation in the medical record that all the tests have been explained and consent has been obtained. It's very important that these patients know that they're being tested and offering the results as well. As far as notification goes, the person ordering the test or that person's designee shall ensure that all reasonable results have been made to notify that subject of the results of their test. The notification of a person with a positive test result shall include information on the availability of medical and support services, how to treat the infection, how to prevent the infection, all has to be offered as part of a positive test result. If the person is negative, however, information on prevention of transmission of HIV should always be offered as well. And when that testing is done in an emergency department of a hospital, a detention facility, or other facility, the test subject has been released before they can be notified of the test results, then the county health department needs to be informed by those facilities that they had an HIV positive subject. Exceptions in Florida law of a positive result a positive preliminary test result may not be revealed to any person except in the following situations. The preliminary test results may be released to a licensed physician or medical or non-medical personnel subject to significant exposure. So patients that uh, test positive for HIV, their physicians or other people that they would be around could possibly be exposed to, they will be informed of those test results. Preliminary test results may be released to healthcare providers and to the persons tested whether decisions about medical care or treatment or the recommendation to the person being tested in the case of pregnancy, pre and postpartum care or the newborn. All these people need to be informed then of the potential for HIV being passed on to the newborn. Positive preliminary HIV tests may not be characterized to the patient as a diagnosis of the HIV infection. So there are a lot of laws for you Florida pharmacists that need to be followed. Make sure you're always keeping up to the informed consent as well as patient confidentiality. We can enforce to our technicians and other pharmacists enough that the information provided to us because we treat HIV patient always needs to be kept confidential. HIV is a very exciting disease to learn about and to follow. We seem to be having more and more new, to, new medications. As we're approaching 30 years of HIV treatment, the medications seem to come out better, more cleaner, 
easier to administer and we as pharmacists from the first time we dispensed an HIV medication till today our goal in treating patients is to make sure that they take their medications as to prescribed to keep these viruses suppressed and to give our patients a long rewarding life. I hope you've enjoyed our presentation. I want to thank my physician assistant students at St. Francis University for helping me out with this program entitled HIV Fact Versus Fiction. I'll be glad to take any of your questions now. Please feel free to type them in the chat box.